I am an OBGYN by training, but unfortunately, things uh, happened along the way that changed my course. I'm really going to jump right into the story, and um, I will give you guys a ton of information in a short period of time. Not sure how many OBGYNs are joining us today, but most of you should remember a slide looking like this from your um, third year rotation and looking at a fetal heart monitor like this, it should kind of bring your heart up to your nose. I was covering the labor floor and got called down to deliver for a precipitous delivery. It was actually a patient of mine who was quite lovely. It was baby number four. It should have just fallen out. Uh, unfortunately, when I looked down, this is similar to where the heart rates were, and thankfully the baby was crowning. I ended up needing six nurses to come help with patient to kind of get her in the position that I needed, and as I put a vacuum on the baby's crown, Unfortunately, I was kicked. The first time she kicked me straight in my brachial plexus, my arm went numb. I changed my position thinking that I was doing myself a favor. And as I guided the widest part of the baby's abdomen out, she kicked me a second time. And this time it kind of came across my shoulder. Two of my nurses were thrown against the nearest wall, immediately started crying I called out for one of my partners to come and help finish. I was happy that the baby was out safely. The mom was fine, but I knew I wasn't. Unfortunately, I ended up with a torn labrum in my left shoulder. My first orthopedist told me that professional baseball pitchers pitched with torn labrums, so I should surely be able to do my job. So I did what all good docs do. I put my head down. I continued to work. I felt like I was losing range of motion. I had some chronic pain. I really was not being listened to in a way that, that I felt I should be. And eventually went to a second orthopedist who basically told me that over the course of eight months, I had developed a textbook case of frozen shoulder, and I needed surgery. I had surgery almost a year to the date of the incident. I woke up with my orthopedist sitting at the foot of my bed telling me that it looked like a bomb went off in my shoulder. I have not been cleared to do OB or operate. I was interestingly cleared to do office gynecology as tolerated, but was never actually given the chance. I was unceremoniously terminated the day that my FMLA was up because unbeknownst to me and my contract, it said that I needed to be able to do 100% of my job duties. And keep in mind, I had just been asked to be the chairperson of our department prior to going out for my surgery. I highly urge everyone to make sure that they go over their contracts with a contract lawyer to make sure that you know what you're signing. This talk is more about finances and specifically disability insurance. I, Interestingly enough, I was denied my workman's comp because they said that while an injury occurred, my frozen shoulder was idiopathic or my fault because I continued to work while I was injured. It was like getting punched in the stomach. Uh, I ended up having to sue. I was in court three times. One time they had a vocational specialist say that I could be a billing secretary because I had the aptitude to learn codes. I sat there in tears. This is not what any of us have gone through training to do. The one thing I will say is that workman's comp varies by state, and whenever you, wherever you decide to train, it's not a bad idea to look into what your state laws are. 
tonight we're really going to focus on what is disability insurance. When we talk about disability insurance, there are things to understand from a really high view, and then there are things that are specific to every individual. It is a commodity, and in that, we're really talking about two major things. There are group benefits and private benefits. Within group benefits, there are two flavors. You have employer benefits and association benefits. Association benefits, I don't spend a whole lot of time on. This is the AMA, the American Academy of fill in the blank. Those policies tend to be blessed and blessed because somebody's paying for them to be blessed. It's not really that they're in our best interest. So I don't spend a whole lot of time with them. Employer benefits, you go, you take a job. Most of them are employer paid meaning it's part of your benefits package. Sometimes your employer will make it voluntary, meaning here we have it. If you want it, you have to pay for it. There are really three major things that we run into when we're talking about the difference between a group policy and a private policy. It really comes down to taxation, ownership, and language. With employer-paid policy is. If it is part of your benefits package, it tends to be one line on your open enrollment packet. A lot of times what people don't understand is that if your employer is paying for the policy, any money that you're going to get from that policy is considered taxable income. If you have a voluntary policy or a private policy that you're paying for with post-tax dollars, the benefit's going to be tax-free. So right out of the gate, tax-free money is much better than taxable money. As far as ownership goes, this one's kind of interesting and, and is sometimes confusing to people. Whether your employer is paying for the group policy or you're paying for the group policy, your employer still owns it. That means they're creating it, they're controlling it, and more often than not, they keep it. It tends to be employment dependent. So if you no longer work there, their benefits are not going with you. With a private policy, you own it. You're helping to create it. You're controlling it. You're keeping it. I liken it to having it in your back pocket the goal is it's going to be what's called portable. You get to take it with you for the entirety of your career. This is probably the most important slide of the entire talk. It is incredibly frustrating. Personally, I think it's on purpose, but there's no standardization of language in the insurance industry like there is in medicine and most other fields. Companies can use the same phrases and define them differently, or they can use different phrases and define them similarly. Even if it's the same carrier and they have a group product and a private product, there's no sync between the two. And I think that it truly is on purpose to keep people confused. And you really want to make sure that you're going over these policies with someone that can help make sense of what this language is. With group policies, and really with, with all policies, why that language is so important is for all of these reasons. We want to know what is the policy actually covering, how much is it covering, and for instance, many group policies will only cover your base, not RVU, not bonus, not overtime. It's only a portion. And we see in a lot of university settings, the way that people are compensated, I've seen up to six different buckets of how people are getting paid. And if they're only covering your base, a lot of people are lulled into thinking that they have more coverage than they actually do. 
Additionally, there's often a max benefit. So people will come to me and say, wait, I have 60% of my income covered and I have to be in an unenviable position to say, well, it's actually 60% of your base income up to $10,000 a month. One of the biggest issues is that our employers don't have to tell us it's one line, open enrollment, you check a box. You actually want to ask for the master copy of the policy because that's where you get into the fine print. Many group policies will say that they're own occupation, but when you actually read the document, it'll say that it may be own occupation for two years and then it switches to any occupation. It may be that the way that they define own occupation is what's called held to the national economy or the local labor market. It is not specific to what one employer does or one employee does at one employer site. That allows them to cast a really wide net that says this is what you would, could, should be able to do based on your training, education, and skill set. More importantly, most of them when you look at how they define total disability, it'll read you're considered totally disabled in the event that you cannot do your job as they've defined it and not be gainfully employed. That definition stinks for most physicians. And I will tell you, I have no secrets. I probably should. But I used to say the old adage, I would give my left arm to be home with my boys more. Turns out I gave my left arm to be home with my boys more. And after six weeks, I was ready to kill everybody. I have the utmost respect for stay-at-home parents. I am not hardwired to be one. And I have since spoken to thousands of disabled physicians who, because of injury or illness, have had to leave medical practice. Almost everybody tries to come up with a way to be a productive member of society, to make income, to get out of the house. And so it's really important that the definition is the right one. And we'll get into what we want that to be in, in just a little bit. Interestingly, they are now really good at kind of hiding other nuances. Um, and what do I mean by that? Well, my policy in fine print didn't cover work-related injuries. And I already told you that my workman's comp denied me initially. So what does this mean? Well, my group benefit, they said, sorry, you would have been better off if you fell off your bike. We are seeing more and more group benefits since the onset of COVID that are not only putting in that they're not covering work-related injuries, they're putting in that they're not covering work-related illnesses. I think that's a super sl slippery slope. I don't know how we're supposed to prove where we contract illnesses from. We're starting to see a lot of group benefits where they limit musculoskeletal um, claims to two years. Oh, by the way, that's the number one reason that physicians leave practice. Most of them will limit mental health coverage to two years. We've seen an increase in what they're calling either subjective illnesses or psychosomatic. Basically, it is including but not limited to things like fatigue, chronic pain, headaches, um, ringing in the ears, things that may not have a pathognomonic test to say that this is black and white. And they are really looking for things not to cover us for. And where an employer thinks maybe they're doing us a favor by having these benefits available to us, oftentimes it's actually a hindrance. And the reason being that it, it affects how much you, you qualify for with supplemental coverage. That's really where having a private policy is so important and makes so much sense. As with everything in medicine, there are exceptions to every rule. 
there are often times where a group benefit is a function of something is better than nothing. Occasionally, there are people that are really hard to cover, or there will be things that a private carrier won't cover that your group benefit, look, you may get it paid for two years, or you may get paid for the majority of, of the policy. And so there's really no hard and fast rule. It is not a one size fits all in um, circumstance. So what makes a good private policy? And I wrote specialty specific because, as I mentioned, there is no standardization of language in insurance and different carriers call your own occupation by something different. That's the most important piece of any private policy is that it is truly specific to what it is you do day in and day out and that the way that the definition of total disability reads is you're considered totally disabled in the event that you cannot do your job regardless if you're gainfully employed in another occupation. So just switching that one word from and to regardless makes a huge difference and can amount to thousands and thousands of dollars over the life of a claim. We want to make sure that we have the ability to get more coverage as our incomes ascend, as we change jobs and maybe have different benefits. Then we get into some of the smaller benefit riders. So everyone has something called a residual or partial benefit. That's a benefit that kicks in if you have to go part-time because of injury or illness. There's something called a cost of living adjustment or COLA, which is inflationary protection. There's a catastrophic benefit in case something really horrible happens. And the biggest difference right now amongst the carriers has to do with how they treat mental health and substance abuse. There are currently six companies that cater to the physician marketplace. That's going to drop to five as of May 1st. Um, I'm curious to see who kind of steps into that void. This has happened in the past. In 2016, MetLife dropped out of the individual disability sales space, and Ohio National took over that um, void. Interestingly, it's Ohio National that's dropping out as of May 1st. And look at all the different phrases that are used to mean specialty specific. There is one outlier, the bottom one on this list, the transitional occupation. This definition adds a phrase to the end of that statement of you're considered totally disabled if you can't do your job, regardless if you're gainfully employed in another occupation, and it adds until you make your pre-disability earnings. Admittedly, this is one of the policies that I have, and I did not know that that's really what I bought. You might be thinking, well, if disability insurance is supposed to be income protection, wouldn't that be the definition that everybody would want? The answer is not necessarily, because if you get hurt early in your career, if you get sick early in your career, and I've seen residents and fellows go out on claim, that company is now only responsible for paying you until you can find a job that makes sixty or $70,000 a year. For me, I wasn't at my ceiling. I was making decent money. And yeah, if I can make what I made the last year I was practicing, I'd be okay. But it's not what I thought I had. I didn't feel as though I was properly educated. I didn't feel as though I was being properly advocated for. And I have to hand in every single to the company that's paying me my bank statements, my profit and loss statements for the company. I'm a part owner. The company can make money. Stephanie Pearson doesn't actually see it, but it can decrease the benefit that I'm getting 
from my policy. Now, one company that has that language, interestingly enough, is doing away with it come May 1st. This year has been pretty interesting. Two companies have come out with new product designs. Emeritus came out with a new design in February. Principal just came out with a new product two weeks ago. Um, and so things are always changing. Same for the ability to increase. There are lots of different phrases used. There are a few more coming up the pike with these two new product changes as of May 1st. So I'm going to have to update my slides. Again, the residual and partial benefit should not come as a surprise now that it varies. And it really varies by carrier and design. And I tend to tell people, think about things that cause fatigue, right? MS, other autoimmune diseases, early degenerative diseases, trying to work through chemotherapy. This is where a, your treating physician is going to say, look, you really can do your job, but maybe a 12-hour day, not sustainable. Maybe taking call isn't possible. Working five days a week, not possible. This is designed to help bridge that gap of money that you're losing because you have to cut some of your time down. Or maybe you're a surgeon who does, you know, um, long ENT cases and you can still operate, but maybe you can't do those giant head and neck cases and you're going to see your income go down if you're RVU related. I will say last year was a really bad year for breast cancer. I'm not sure if it's because women put off their mammograms during COVID, but every single one of our women who went out for breast cancer tried to work while they were recovering and while they were going through chemo. Every carrier has a different trigger. So some start if you lose 15% of your income, some you have to lose 20%. Some of them, how they pay you back changes. It may be dollar for dollar up to your benefit amount. It may be straight percentages. And so again, if you're looking at policies side by side, you're not necessarily comparing apples to apples. And you really want to make sure that somebody is taking you through and explaining what's unique, what's universal, where are these differences? Same thing for the cost of living adjustment. So this kicks in when you go on claim. So you are sick or injured. The company is paying you a benefit as you hit your anniversary. So going into month 13, 25, 37, the benefit you're actually getting paid goes up based on the language in the policy. And again, varies by carrier and even within a carrier, there may be more than one option. This is obviously going to amount to more money the younger you are, right? I've had nine increases on one of my policies, and it makes a considerable difference. The catastrophic benefit, they're all pretty much aligned. This is an additive benefit if something really horrible happens. You are left unable to perform two or more of your six activities of daily living without assistance. If you are severely cognitively impaired and need a shadow, you actually get an additional benefit to help with those increased costs. It's probably the most hotly debated benefit I truly am of the ilk of I'd rather have it and not need it than need it and not have it. But if somebody says to me, Steph, what's the first thing you would get rid of? This is usually the first thing I would get rid of because you'd already be getting your monthly benefit. Now, the mental health and substance abuse coverage, they lump this together under the same umbrella. And it varies widely. As you can see here, different companies, again, have different options. The five-year aggregate is going to cease to exist as of May 1st. 
basically what the companies will say is if you opt for less than life coverage, and by life, I don't mean until you die. I mean the life of the policy. Most go to 65, 67, or 70. If you take a lesser benefit, it often comes with a discount. And so the first thing I always say to people is, how important is this coverage? If you have a strong family history, if you feel like you may not seek care if you needed it, then you may want to pay to have full coverage. If on the other hand, you have no family history, you feel like you have a strong support network, you would seek care if you needed it, there's definitely a financial incentive to having less coverage. Not every carrier gives you all of the options. So again, you may not be comparing apples to apples. And for some physicians, we actually can't get more than a two-year benefit. Uh, currently, emergency medicine, pain management, anesthesia can only get a two-year benefit. There's one company that'll give two, uh, a two-year per episode. So in theory, there's no ceiling, but you have to be back to work for a year before the clock resets. For OBGYNs, it depends on the carrier. Some carriers will let us go for life, some won't. Um, and that's because of the Venn diagram that is mental health and substance abuse. If you remember fun di Venn diagrams from middle school, by last record, the three groups that go out the most for mental health are EM, anesthesia, and OB. And they lump pain with anesthesia, even though now you can get to pain from a few different ways. The three that have gone out the most for substance abuse, interestingly, are EM, anesthesia, and psych. So I won't be surprised if in the next year or two that this coverage gets limited for psychiatrists as well. One of the things that I've tried to do to kind of make this a little easier to understand, because again, I realize that this is a lot of information, is to try to compare three different physician stories and looking at what people think versus what's reality. And when you put it in numbers, it tends to make the story make a little more sense. So keep in mind, all three physicians we're looking at as similar. They all have a $250,000 salary with a $25,000 annual bonus, and their group benefit covers 60% of their base income to $6,500 a month. This is not an uncommon story. I will say we've started to see group benefits cover a little bit higher, more in the $10,000 a month, $15,000 a month, but I have seen it as low as $1,000 a month which I think is somewhat criminal. So this is a story that I hear a lot. I, I'm fine. I have a group benefit. It's covering 60% of my income. So you can see here that the assumption that this doctor had was that they would be making $165,000 a year in benefit. So that's looking at the 275 after taxes. The truth of the matter is it's only going to be a benefit up to $78,000 a year. But remember, if this is an employer benefit, that money is getting taxed. And so here we have a doc who thinks that they're bringing in $165,000 a year and is really only bringing in $62,000 after taxes. That is not the talk that I like having. Now, physician B, kind of closer to my story um, in that I did get a policy right out of training, but didn't keep pace with my income. So I'm kind of like this guy. So they thought 60% of their income was covered. They were smart and got a resident policy 
for $5,000 a month, which would be tax free. And I'll use this as a quick aside. All residents qualify for a $5,000 a month benefit. You don't have to take the full five, but that's as much as the companies will offer you while you're in training. Some of the carriers have recently gone up a little bit higher. Um, once you become an attending, the game changes. How much you qualify for becomes predicated by internal algorithms that look at how much money do you make, what benefits do you have, who pays for them, and then they tell us what you qualify for. It's not like someone can come to me and say, Steph, I want $20,000 a month in benefit. I'm willing to pay for it. If the numbers don't work, the numbers don't work. So physician B had an assumption again that 60% of their full income was covered, forgot that it was taxable, and add in the 60000 tax-free. So there was an assumption of 225000 Again, 78000 is going to get taxed. 60000 won't. And the take home is approximately 122,000. So physician B is sitting in a much better position than physician A. However, physician C, who I hope everybody is moving forward, is the doc who understood that there was a maximum benefit from the group benefit, understood that it was going to get taxed, but kept pace with their income and now has a policy just shy of $11,000 a month. Well, it's a big difference, right? Physician A was only bringing home about $62,000. Physician C is making pretty close to what they'd be making when you take their gross and, and tax it. So this is somebody who was educated properly, who's being followed up with, who has what they should have in place and understands that they will be taken care of if something happens. Now, obviously, I have to caveat this with, if you remember, I didn't get my group benefit and I can't take that into account for these because that's still the exception to the rule. Hopefully that helped uh, line it up a little bit better. One of the things that I like to talk about is some of the roadblocks that we see in medical underwriting. So part of every application process is something called medical underwriting. Depending on what your initial ask is, you may have to give up some blood, other bodily fluids. You absolutely have to answer a million questions a million times. There's no secrets from insurance companies. They have access to your medical records, your pharmaceutical records, your motor vehicle records. And so we want to try to fix some maybe not great behavior. Uh, and part of what our company is really proud of doing is managing realistic expectations. I don't like surprises. I don't want any of our clients to have surprises. And I think it's really important that there's no kind of bait and switch into what somebody thinks that they're going to be getting. These are three of the biggest. Um, I'm often surprised at how many physicians are writing their own scripts. I'm not super surprised at how many have friends do it. Admittedly, I've done it um, in my former life. It's bad. It's really bad. It's one of the few things that will actually cause a declination in coverage. And so carriers want to see that people are being followed appropriately. They view self-prescribing as us trying to hide something. And I get it. I remember being a resident. I remember being a busy attending. We don't have time to eat, sleep, go to the bathroom, let alone make our own doctor's appointments. But this is one of those things. It is a huge, huge problem. If, and, and let me take a, a step back. 
if you're writing somebody a one-time script for a UTI, that person's not really going to run into trouble. The major meds that get red flagged are antidepressants, anxiolytics, sleep agents, narcotics, weight loss drugs, ADHD meds, high dose steroids, and infertility drugs. I tell people at the end of the day, if you have a friend asking you to write them one of these medications, the first question that you should ask them is, do you have private disability in place? And if their answer is no, then you owe it to them as a friend to say, you can't do this. I shouldn't say this, but once somebody has a private policy in place, it's not going to cause as much trouble. But if they don't have a policy in place, you are doing them a disservice. If anybody listening is currently self-prescribing, please stop. Please get into a PCP or a therapist. Make sure that there is a paper trail behind your medications. Women's health, look, I'm an OBGYN. Women's health is super, super important to me. And I tell every woman that they need to have a private policy in place before the first time they get pregnant. If you've had a miscarriage within 12 months of applying, they will not cover future pregnancies. If you have gestational diabetes, um, if you have cytopenia of pregnancy, there's a list of potential pregnancy complications that will result in a carrier saying they're not going to cover future pregnancies. If you have been to REI and there's even a note in your chart that you're being worked up for infertility, they're not going to cover future pregnancies. When I started doing this several years ago, any woman that had had a C-section automatically had no future pregnancies covered. I kind of went a little bit nuts. I started sending in white papers, ACOG bulletins. I just want things to be fair. I will say that community medicine and insurance medicine, not the same. But I really fought hard for that one because I make breech babies. And me having a C-section because of a breech child, that's not a pregnancy complication. That's standard of care. And it would have had nothing to do with certain outcomes in another pregnancy. It's probably one of the biggest feathers in my cap. At one point, we did have all six companies willing to change the language so that they would cover future pregnancies. They just put an exclusion for complications from repeat C-sections. I am sorry to say that one of the companies has gone back to the original language. But all that means now is if I talk to somebody who's had a C-section before, I'm not going to show them that one company. Um, additionally, screening tests, they want to see that pap smears are up to date. For our older docs, they want to see that mammograms are up to date. And if there are abnormalities, they're not going to cover your cervix until you've had two negative pap smears. Mammograms get way more confusing, but we want to make sure, one, that we get the coverage put in place before mammograms start. Obviously, with pap smears starting at 21, that, that's just impossible, is kind of my, my current big fight. Um, it's one of the few things that changes the cost of a policy. And you can be too big or too small. My biggest problem with it right now is that it's based on an actuarial BMI chart. It's not even the BMI charts that we use in our offices, which already are flawed because they're basically based on European Caucasian men. I'm running into a lot of cases of um, people of different ethnicities who are really constitutionally small and are being penalized. And 
I'm making progress. It's not across the board, um, but we are starting to see a little bit of a change there. Obviously, you want to try to get this when you are at your best health. They're also not very nice about weight loss. Um, weight loss surgeries, there is an automatic, what's called health hold. So if you've had a gastric bypass, if you've had a gastric sleeve, no one right now will cover you at least for the first year. And there are a lot of limitations from year one to year five. There's also a question on every application that says, have you gained or lost more than 10 pounds in the last 12 months? If your answer is yes, they will either add or subtract half of your answer. And so even though you may be moving in the right direction, the carriers are still going to kind of hold that against you. And so, again, you want to make sure that you're speaking with somebody who understands all of these intricacies and can set realistic expectations. Obviously, you know, the biggest thing that people talk about is, okay, at the end of the day, how much does this cost? And I do want to preface this with, I think that we have been socialized really not to think about this as being important, but if I were to ask the people on this call, how many of you have health insurance? How many of you have car insurance? How many of you have homeowners or renters insurance? Car insurance, right? We know uh, we're supposed to have that stuff, but this is our biggest asset is our ability to make money. Admittedly, it's not cheap. And I am sorry to say that it's more expensive for women than it is for men. Life insurance is actually the opposite. It's more expensive for men than women. It's not entirely as sexist as it would appear. It's based in real actuarial data Women have historically left all fields because of injury or illness more than men. Men have historically died younger and more successfully at their own hands. So that's where the price gradient comes from. There used to be a number of carriers that had gender neutral or unisex pricing for residents and fellows. Over the last two years, they have slowly been removed. Um, and they're really, really few and far between now. These are the things that kind of go into cost without looking at those things like BMI. Um, there are a couple of other health issues that affect cost. Um, and again, that becomes a, a individual discussion, but, but these are the main factors. And the reason that we tend to try to get residents and fellows to get a purchase, to get a policy early, is that there are still really deep discounts that the carriers will offer to fellows and residents that then stays with you for the life of the policy and really does amount to thousands and thousands of dollars of savings over the life of your policy that should you wait until you're in attending we don't have access to. So remember, I got my first policy as an attending. I went back and ran some numbers of the what if, and it was not pretty. So you want to get this as young as you can. I would really venture to say that the magic time is actually right after match. Um, I have seen some med students taken advantage prior to declaring your specialty, everybody gets classed at the most expensive class. So all of the carriers kind of pigeon different physicians into different occupational classes, which is their risk mitigation of what their cost is. Once you match, that changes. And I think that that time between match and starting internship is actually a really good time to get this done. If you don't do it then, you know, then I always say absolutely before you finish training, but obviously the younger you are, the healthier you are, the better off you are. 
but absolutely before you finish training. 